good evening friends uh, uh, so today we will be uh, not taking the ecg class and we will be talking about coronary disease how it has evolved from the past what is it present and what is the future of coronary disease like So almost uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, this was the first ECG mission. The coronary artery disease understanding started with this first ECG mission, which was uh, uh, there from 1903. See how big is the ECG mission and uh, no sick patient can sit like this for uh, minutes and hours together to record ECG. So this is how it's the journey of EC started and now you know it's a handheld machine and we can always move it to any part of the world and you can take an ECG. So from moving on from the ECG, we, the coronary heart disease evolved into the next stage by first heart catheterization. So this was a radiographer and he himself took a Foley's catheter, nothing to do with the cardiac catheter. He took a Foley's catheter and inserted into his left upper limb, cubital fossa, and pushed the catheter into the heart through the venous system. And it reached the right side of the heart. And this was the first catheterization where he demonstrated the heart image can be understood much better with a catheter in place. This happened in 1929. Based on the understanding of the anatomy and lot of autopsies, and uh, as uh, we were students, only the professor's final diagnosis was final. So likewise, uh, the best clinician gave us the final diagnosis and those diagnosis, based on the diagnosis, surgery started happening. Especially the atrius septal defect, ASD defect was operated upon. So there was the first surgery happened in 1953. So this was a surgery which happened in the center of a hall. And there was a balcony around it. And many people started witnessing the surgery standing on the right on top of the balcony and the surgeons were operating and obviously the heartland mission was so big in the room that it occupied almost 50% of the room. So in 1953, the first surgery happened. And by the time the, something special happened, the World War II uh, gave us a lot of lessons and one lesson was uh, echocardiogram. Because the World War II, the submarine was tra tracked by a radar. So the sound was transmitted within the by the radar in the sea, and on the based on the re reflection of the sound, they calculated where the submarine was, and they started attacking the submarine. So based on the sound transmission and its grasping power, and on return from the sound, they tracked the heart. Heart is moving. So based on the moving subject. They tracked something, some abnormal signals. Based on the signals, they found some of the heart's movement can be tracked. So the first M mode came in 1953 and evolved into a bigger in 1960s. So this is how it started. The first report had happened in 1954, rather, and it started with a, a echocardiogram. So it was a cardiologist and a physicist, not a doctor. So who was working in the World War II, they understood the need of the cardiologist and they made the first echocardiogram. And this one in 1961, exactly to be precise, 58, they started having small, small catheterization. And one guy called Sones, he developed a methodology to record an angiogram. So he put in a catheter, 
designed a catheter such a way that he inserted the catheter into the iota and then engaged the coronary artery and did the angiogram. So we started learning all these things with the echo, then angiogram. Then the need for coronary care unit started. So why it was coronary care unit? Because the patients, every system patients were there sitting in, sitting in the same hospital. I mean, the nurses are not trained to manage multi-system. So there was a CCU coronary care unit started in 1961. This happened in uh, UK, that is Scotland, and uh, the, and the Edinburgh. So in 1961, the Desmond Julian had the concept of the coronary care unit. So what is the concept? So it, it is simple. All the chest pain patients were admitted in the same, same ICU. That's all. So the, there was a monitor which was recording the events. So there was a recording of monitor, whatever we have now, that it was there in 1961. So the recording was done. And there was hardly any treatment for uh, acute MI except complete bed rest and heparin. Small, small medication, nothing more than that. And the patient was uh, given a complete bed rest and no attendants were allowed. And the patient was there for uh, almost one month, something like that, after uh, for an acute MI and uh, resting completely. So this was the complete management. So the concept was continuous uh, ECG monitoring, the cardiopulmonary station, which was infertile, but still it was there started. When there is a VEP, VEP, VF, there was a ventricular fibrillator, defibrillator was there. The clustering of patient made the personnel skilled. The doctor was more skilled and the nurses were skilled. And there were ready-made drugs which was available immediately for administration. So patients started understanding the concept of CCU care. So this is how the journey of uh, cardiology started. ECG was... Uh, in the beginning of the 90s, 1990s, 90s, then the, some patients, uh, acute MI was understood after ECG. Then uh, some, uh, 1923, the first published was there. Then a lot of cases started coming. The 1953, first cardiac surgery happened. And the efficiency of CPR was understood in 1960. CCU care was there. And slowly, steadily, we understood what is uh, pulmonary edema, what, how to classify uh, cardiac acute MI, then how to put a IABP, how heart transplantation happened. This all happened in 1960s and 70s. So, so many things happened in the rush of, rush of things happened in 1960s. And in 1978, this gentleman uh, who is called as Andrus Grisnik, so this guy was supremely intelligent, one of the most intelligent characters in the world to, to be born. So he understood the whole pathology and he demonstrated in 1977, see the lesion, there is a narrowing in the 19, yellow mark is there, narrowing in 1977. There is no stent or anything. He not only engaged the catheter, passed a wire across, and dilated the wire, uh, the lesion with a balloon. And this uh, stayed with for 10 years, see, 1987. 10 years it was patent. So where putting a wire and balloon into the coronary artery requires a lot of guts because nobody has done it and the patient is dying, means he is he, pooped. So now he demonstrated his skill in such a way that he can do an angioplasty in a human and not only he was uh, he did it, he was very happy to share his knowledge everywhere, for every part of the world. And see, everywhere started flocking, every part of the world, cardiology started flocking him and away and learned from him. And he was so intelligent, but uh, all intelligent people, as uh, our Raman Jam or anybody, he also died very young. <laughs> the reason for his death was he was the pilot of his own plane. So he, he knew everything, whatever he did, he was supreme, he was master, and he piloted his own aircraft, and the patient the aircraft crashed, and he died in 1987, 84. So this is what uh, his story, and he only showed the way cardiology can be done, and this resulted in understanding of angiogram, in development of all fields of medicine, gastroenterology, urology, 
a neurology, whatever field you take, this one uh, university invention created a awareness for everything and uh, made them understand that this is very well. So this made the understanding of disease very well. And in 1960s, pre-CCU era, the mortality in the, after an acute MI was 30 percent. So it means out of 100 people, 30 people died uh, within an MI, within one or two weeks within an MI. So the CCU era, where in 1960s, the CCU was there, depopulation, hemodynamic monitor, beta blocker started coming and heparin. So this reduced the mortality by 15 percent. So I mean, so it, it halved to 15 percent. So it was a good recovery in 10 years. So from 30 percent mortality in 1970s, it became 15 percent. <coughs> then thrombolysis have started happening. So once we started thrombolysis, the mortality came down further down, 6.5 percent with streptokines. Now you can see how good a treatment can decrease the mortality and this is the breakthrough in medical field because this is a straight away you are seeing so much of mortality benefit. So not only it means that uh, thrombolysing, opening the coronary artery via lysis is only going to save the patient, no. So we have got a lot of medication. Beta blocker came in 1960s, AC inhibitor came in 1970s and statins came in 1976. So the main medication for cardiology started in 1960s and 1970s and we had beta blocker, AC inhibitor and 1976 uh, statin came. So what happened? So aspirin was the only drug available at that point of time. So I am only giving aspirin. We all know that loading dose, giving loading dose very, very important. Giving aspirin, how much, how many patients are saved? See here, only by giving an aspirin. Nothing is there. You complete rest, aspirin. You find 11 people only died and 89 people are saved. So not the importance of loading dose. Aspirin's importance. You have chest pain, give a loading dose of aspirin and clopidogrel or ticagrel, whatever you have. Only aspirin will save 89 people. Only 11 people died. You add clopidogrel to it, another two people are saved. So that is the reason why dual antiplatelets are given as loading dose. So you give clopidogrel and you give aspirin two loading dose, combined loading dose, clopidogrel of 300 milligram or at soluble aspirin of 350 milligram. You are seeing through that now only nine people are dead after an acute MI. So it's a landmark uh, drugs. So you should, that's the reason why whenever there is a suspicion of acute coronary syndrome, always even I, I take give the loading dose even before taking easy. When, the, when I walk into the cash hall, it's just fine. Typical history. I just give them the loading dose and then take a ECG because I'm confident about the clinical scenario as well as confident about the medication which I'm dealing with. So one only thing what we understood over a period of time is clopidogrel is a prodrug and it is not completely responding to all people. 25-30% of people doesn't achieve the enough inhibition. So we thought of doing something more. So something more came in the form of uh, prasugral. Prasugral was far superior to clopidogrel. But only thing came with a bleeding manifestation. So we had next molecule, ticagrelal. This is what the brilliant we have. The ticagrelal is super like prasugral and less bleeding like clopidogrel. It means a super drug where it is working wonderfully like crassugrel, but has less bleeding like clopidogrel. So it means that clopidogrel has got no role in stenting. So it is all ticagrelal now. Ticagrelal has replaced everything. We are no more using crassugrel on a regular basis because it causes a lot of bleeding. So we have the much potent ticagrelal with less bleeding. So we give loading dose of ticagrelal 90 mg, 180 milligram and disprint. So this is how the loading dose is given in our setup. So this makes the patient much more comfortable. So then in 2004, we had one of our Indian from uh, Kerala studied in Manipal. This guy uh, gave uh, uh, the world the 
risk factors of acute MI. So in 2004, this landmark study came and the key, key told these patients are likely to have coronary artery disease much more common and acute coronary syndrome is much more common. So dyslipidemia, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, abdominal obesity, stress and less vegetables, less exercise and alcohol intake all can lead to more coronary artery disease. This is the study why moderate alcohol was allowed a, not in India, in US and Europe because of the cold weather that can cause can, for some protection. This, this is the reason why some people also claim in India there is some alcohol moderate, consumption moderate amount helps now and not in India. It is in cold weather of US and UK, Europe. So these are the risk factors with which we are working on. So this caused this one. So you have got a fatty streak, which is there, deposition of cholesterol within the vessel wall. We understood the risk factor. If it is there over a period of time, it slowly accumulates, increases in size. And if the plug ruptures or erodes, you have a platelet aggregation and completely occludes the coronary artery and can cause an acute MI, or non estelation or estelation MI. Now you understood how was this the disease. It starts with the risk factor. See the risk factor. And over a period of time, the risk factor is not controlled. It causes accumulation of cholesterol within the vessel wall and can cause an acute MI. So this, this is the reason why yes, lesser plug also can cause, the plug rupture can cause an acute MI or a large plug also can cause an non estimation commonly. So what is the acute MI? How does it happen? You see with the time frame, it is running here, 20, 1 hour, 2 hour, 3 hour, 6 hour. So the white area which is have, which you are visualizing is the area of necrosis. So it means that if you are delaying the treatment, the area of whatever is the kind of arterial supply will be necrosed and it is lost. It can be even if you grieve crores and crores or rupees cannot be reached. So time is muscle. The carrying home message in coronary artery disease in the current scenario is time is muscle. Don't waste time. Whenever you see a ECG, typical history, acute MI, do not waste time. You have to either thrombolize or send the patient for a primary PCA. So we have to act very quickly based on see the cartoon clearly shows that okay, how difficult is the necrosis and how rapidly propagating necrosis. So what, how, why is the PTC available, primary PTC available for everybody? No. So most of the people working in a sub, uh, in a non tertiary care center, then we have to deal with uh, streptokinase or retaplase or tranectoplase, streptokinase, uh, which is, we have been using it for almost three, four decades, but only thing, see here the efficiency, 50% only efficient drug. Even though we give the drug, we think it is working, it is only efficient in 50% of the time. It is not efficient drug. Pain may decrease with time because necrosis happened. Once necrosis is there, there is no pain. So pain may decrease with time. The ST may resolve because the necrosis happened, but opening of the coronary happens only 50% of the time in thrombolysis with streptokinase. So we are not dealing with the best drug, but common drug, commonly we are using it for want of financial issues. Then came the retaplase and renectoplase. Both opened the coronary artery by a larger extent, 70% of the time. So I see 70% of the time, most of the time it is opening. Ease of administration, rapidly we can give. Everything is wonderful except the cost. So where streptokinase is costing around 3,000, means this will be costing around 50,000. So we have to ensure that the patients are getting the right treatment. If they are not able to get the right treatment, that is the primary PCA, we can give tenecteplase or retaplase streptokinase in patients who are not able to afford the complete treatment. Right? So every minute delay, Either PCA or thrombolysis is going to worsen the mortality. See here, this every minute, this is the reason why we call it as time is muscle and time is death. So if the delay in time, more patients are likely to die. So which is better, PTCA or fibromyalgia, thrombolysis? This is the question which we have. Because both of the both of us, the both of the things are available in our treatment now. See here, PTCA is much, much, much superior to fibrinolysis. See here, death is much lesser with PTCA. VMI is much lesser. Recurrent ischemia is much lesser. Less amount of stroke. 
hemorrhage stroke is not at all there. So death MI pull together, everything is far, far better with a PCI, not with fibrolysis. So that is the reason why primary PCI scores over uh, thrombolysis in most situations. Now we have a, five, five, a concept of pharmacology, pharmacoinvasive where we can give pharmacoinvasive pharmacology therapy, streptokinase or any tenecteplase or retoplase and should immediately shift the patient for angiogram within 3 to 24 hours. So that we, what if it is not opening, then we can open mechanically by a PCI. So this is the reason we are we, are, we advocate either PCI as a directly or pharmacoinvasive methodology. So for every 1,000 patients treated, PTCA compared with lytic therapy, see here, 20 lives are saved by doing a primary PCA. 43 re-MI is prevented. 13 intracranial hemorrhage is prevented. So this is the data. So it means PCA is far, 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 far superior to thrombolysis. So this is the current scenario in uh, coronary heart disease. So the meta-analysis of whatever the trial we say, coronary heart disease is intervention is much more superior to medical management. So, whenever you come across an acute coronary syndrome, either ST elevation or a non-ST elevation, proponent positivity, non-ST elevation MI, or an acute ST elevation MI, invasive therapy intervention by either angioplasty or surgery is far, far, far superior to medical management. Please do not get satisfied with medical management because a lot of people can die. We can save out of 1,000 people, we can save 20 people. That's a very high number. So most people are saved when the patient has got a left, a left mind disease or severe triple cell disease. So the more and more sicker the patients are will benefit from your intervention. So how it has evolved over a period of time? See here, the innovations have improved a lot. ECHO has improved. We have got a fantastic machine where everything can be recorded in the resolution has got better. The under hemodynamic understanding has got better. So with the echo, we can do a lot of things. And we can do your angioplasty. And more importantly, the competency and the training program has increased a lot where we, we are able to do all the procedures, whatever given in the textbook, where whatever is happening in New York or London, right away in our cath lab, because of the competency with which we are developed over a period of time of training and efficiency. So what is happening in the present? So whenever there is going to be an acute coronary syndrome, we stent the patients. See, this is how we do it. The stent, we clear the pathway of cholesterol. We put a stent, a stent across. The stent is placed here. And all the devices which take, take, took the stent into the coronary artery is taken out. And that stent remained there. Okay, keeping the vessel patent. So this is what happens in current scenario in our medication. So what is happening in present? Not only we are happy, happy to do a stent, we are doing physiology also. What, what we see in the lesion is anatomical. We say 70-80% stenosis is anatomy. Whether it is significant on a given time, like doing a treadmill, we do FFR, fractional flow reserve, so that we put a catheter across the lesion and we assess the severity of the lesion physiologically, and we based on the severity, if it is severe, we stent or do a CABG. So we start doing it, further working on it. So once we, we have worked with last decade, it has evolved much further. Now we see this is an intravascular ultrasound. Whatever we see, do ultrasound in the abdomen likewise, we put a catheter into the coronary artery, we visualize the layer of the coronary artery with a sound wave. It is the ultravascular ultrasound. We can visualize the lumen, the all layers of the vessel wall, whether on the obstructive plug, whether it be the plug is thrombus or fibrosis, calcium, everything we can visualize with the intravascular ultrasound. And this is a light-based event. This is the OCT, optical coherence tomography. It means the light is transmitted and it is returned back to the catheter and we assess the image. See here on the left side, we got a stenosis and we have stented it. So based on the image of the OCT, the light transmits and gets away the images. And this gives you the understanding of OCT. Okay, within the cell wall, what is the lesion? What is the content of the lesion? 
and after stenting, whether the stent has been placed properly, everything you can look into by a technology. So whether we are happy with this, so the, we are to, slowly eating into CABG territory, that is surgeon territory. See, this is an area of uh, bifurcation. That means the left, this is the left artery descending on the left side, what I am focusing. So this left artery descending artery divides into two, which is larger branch. If uh, there is a critical narrow, you see here hardly any flow is happening. And you can see, you can see the divide, flow divider and the coronary artery is well open and you got a very good opening. We call it as bifurcation the angioplasty. So we are putting a metal within a metal and opening it. So we are just opening so that the metal is not, it's a prothrombotic pro state. So we, are, we ensure that no clotting happens because, because of our technology. These are all happened in the last 10 years and we have improved a lot over a period of time. So now we are going into the territory of left mind. See here, this is a patient with an emergency who came with a waiting for CABG, who came with an acute foundation syndrome with poorly recordable BP. We took him into the cath lab because we cannot put, push him into the CABG, OT, CVTS, OT immediately. See, we pushed him into the cath lab and 20 minutes down the line, this is how the lesion is. So patient with a purely recordable BP, pulmonary edema, everything by a matter of 20 minutes, we fixed up the lesion. And the patient, this was this happened two years back in this patient, which we regularly do like this. So this patient had a angioplasty and he is still alive and he comes to my follow for a long time. So this is how we save the patient in case of emergency. And the technology and the hardware has improved a lot so that this happens in our place very commonly. So this is one another case. See here, this is uh, you can appreciate slowly. The there is a left main which is distally stenosed and LAD which is critically stenosed and LCX also stenosed. And LAD is cut off at this point. So what we have done is, so this patient again they did not want surgery, and now we have opened the completely LAD left main. So these are all happening. Left main is not an easy angioplasty to do. Very few people do it here uh, successfully. Some people do it, but not successfully. Very few people do it successfully. And it is a very common practice to do it in our hospital because most of the patients come here for a tertiary care and we need to do it and handle it with proper. So this is how the result will be there. And the technology allows us to do it in the current year. Whether we are happy with uh, all the uh, left main and bifurcation stenting, now it is further we have evolved with the technique. This is what the current is all about. So this is a completely the right coronary artery. See here, there is a calcium as well as a complete stenosis of the right coronary artery. We are seeing a, this is a diamond burr. We call it as diamond burr rotablation. See here, it is rotating at around 1,80,000 times a minute. This is what it, it rotates rapidly and shaves off the calcium. Calcium is completely shaved off. So it clears the pathway so that when uh, the stent is going inside the vessel wall. See here the final result. It completely shaves off and giving a, yeah? this is what is the current in cardiology where we can easily shave off the lesion and uh, put in a stent across it without any difficulty. So this is the technology has improved for a period of time. So here again, we have got intravascular lithotripsy. Here, like your breaking of stone in the kidney, we again break the calcium within the vessel wall by this technology. The high-speed sonic waves are generated and it is generating and breaking the stone within the vessel wall. And once the stone is broken, we clear the pathway and put a stent across. So the technology has improved over a period of time. So this is, uh, these are all what I have told is landmark and which we are doing it regularly in a, on a daily basis in our setup and uh, what is there in future. So in future, uh, cardiologists will have a little role because your CT scan, already it is coming, it started coming in experimentally. The CT scan, CT angiogram with a FFR. It is combining anatomy and physiology. It will give the lesion and also the significance of the lesion. So it gives both anatomy and physiology. So I expect five to 10 years from now, this will happen in Trichy as well. So the, there will be a CT scan where CT angiogram as well as the FFR will be there. 
like a health checkup every year people can go there and do a ct and ffr and the patient can have a good idea of why, what is there and whether we need to go after go ahead, having the ct angiogram they will come to the cardiologist so the role of general practitioner and physicians are going to increase again because most of the people with the diabetic follow up can be, will be having ct angiogram and they will be deciding on the treatment modality so what is going to be happening elsewhere see here artificial intelligence is going to completely take charge so we can sit in any part of the world use a robo with the artificial intelligence so completely we can ensure that the person who is sitting in america london uh, anywhere for any part of the world uh, controlling the cath lab by means of artificial intelligence completely they uh, uh, operate the whole the whole thing by visualizing uh, the images what is happening in our cath lab and the robo can operate upon they can operate the robo and do angioplasty from there so what is going what is there in future cardiologists will have no role so 10 years down the line few cardiologists who is equipped enough with physics knowledge that is doing a angioplasty by means of robo will be the prime person of doing it one advantage precision will be there second advantage for the cardiologists is no radiation robo will be there doing the all the persons will be there sitting in the console room without radiation and doing the procedure so how much we have advanced and what more important holographic display of procedure so whenever we are doing a procedure if there is a doubt we can switch on the holographic like a google glass we can switch on the holograph it will give the normal anatomy and if you are deviating from the pathway we can always correct ourselves and do the angioplasty or other procedures holographic images are going to be there in future in 2033 i believe this will be there so artificial intelligence and interventional cardiology are going to be precision accurate and data driven the procedure will be assisted so everything will be data driven and uh, it will be based on science and physiology and anatomy will be combined with it and better outcomes are going to be there so what is going to be future so if the patient has a coronary disease nanotechnology that is you give the medication we are now right now we know that a lot of thrombus thrombus no flow everything will tell that is a lot of thrombus in the vessel wall so that the even we establish a flow it is not flowing well so every time everything we will be talking now here the medication technology will not be there as though we are going to inject through a intravascular it will be injected into the site of interest where nano technology will see through that the medication reaches the area of clot directly and it will breaks down the clot very very well so see here nano technology is going to be the future so it is going to, in 10 years it is going to be the future and whenever there is going to be a necrosis time is muscle we were talking about you save the patient once you save the patient severe lv dysfunction ef 20% inject stem cells it is going to come in future and the stem cells will regenerate the heart muscle so ef will be there 70% in one year so you have to save vt vf and patient save the patient and uh, after save, saving the patient okay, you can regenerate the muscle and robots will do a cabg and pca see what is there in future 10 15 years now see like your uh, artificial intelligence where it is going to replace all job any in any professional it is also going to replace the job in cardiology and any medical profession so robotics is going to be there in future it will already they started coming in a big way in uh, western countries and india it's also started happening so nanotechnology drug delivery system will be there but precisely the drug will be there and action will be precise and you have got the best outcome and stem cell will replace all your lost myocardium so what more you want so you have to pay patient has to reach the hospital and the patient will live regenerate the heart get the best treatment and 10 years down the line you have to live for another 10 years to have the benefit of everything so i see a market change in the way every medical field is going to practice and cardiology as you see is the forerunner of everything and this will be the breakthrough technology will happen in 10 years down the line and we will be seeing all this technology in our lifetime and we should also enjoy it thanks for your patient hearing i will unmute you can unmute and start asking questions by i can be happy to answer 
Good evening, sir. Dr. Damu. Sir, good evening. Sir, life expectancy will touch 100, I think that's... <laughs> Sir, life expectancy will it definitely touch 100. Be, but only thing is, uh, they will have other morbidity, sir. They are oncological problem. Everything will come. So that is okay. With the longevity, there will be a lot of other problems will come, sir. Anyway, there other will be, side effects may come. Other the, the longevity, the God will find some other way to take them out at 80 or 90. But only thing, so, the quality of life will improve with time. So the cardiac transplantation rate will come down, I think. And definitely, sir. Transplantation will get down. And uh, good. most important is good quality of life. Yes, yes. Thanks, sir. Two points. So transplantation surgery will come down. So the cost effect, it's a main issue for Indians, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. The cost effect. Cost effect is the major issue. Yes, sir. Yeah. See, to overcome the cost effect, everybody has to do it. That's the problem. Once you have a large volume, the cost is going to come down. So, the, I always say, everybody should start using tenectoplase and retoplase and stop using streptokinase. So, okay, because, because a large amount of usage of tenectoplase, the margin with which the pharmaceutical company is working, will decrease the margin and uh, any of the profit will be there because of the large volume of use. So, uh, a mere large volume usage will always decrease the cost. Good, good sir, good morning, sir. I am Malay Sulba. Sir, uh, the, uh, sir, the loading those lab, Feature la on the beta blocker nala block 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 beta blocker art pandra madriana or concept of the only opinion and answer. No way, answer la pulse rate increase are the nala other day worsening or the gamma. So basically, the loading those in the concept la the mono truck order would beta blocker add pandra the putti only only the long term or legenda experience are the putti ning and a certain. So beta blocker has got zero role in loading dose. That is the concept because loading dose is you are treating the pathology. Yes, so pathology is plug has ruptured or eroded. Now platelet is aggregating. That is the first step over which clotting factors happen and then fibrin mesh happens. Yes, so your loading dose is to is prevent the platelet aggregation so that the patient gets better. Why yes, beta sir. blocker will never come as a loading dose? Because yes, you are having inferior volume as well as anterior volume. So yes, inferior volume can have complete heart block. You give yes, beta blocker, you are worsening the complete heart block and patient can die of complete heart block. One. Yes, sir. In case of anterior volume, where you have a severe elevated dysfunction, yes, cardiac output is equal to heart rate yes, into stroke volume. This is the bottom line. Yes, sir. So when there is a severe elevated dysfunction, acute MI, so, cardiac output is always maintained by a heart rate because stroke volume is decreased because of the less amount of myocardium. So, yes, heart rate has to be there. In anterolamate, tachycardia is there only to see through that the cardiac output is maintained the patient is living. Yes, so, try to give a beta blocker and try to decrease the heart rate, you are going to lose the patient. That is the reason why IV beta blocker which was advised earlier to decrease the heart rate is going to improve the patient. It was sure. totally went up because it is now contraindicated. So, sure. so at the so yeah, same, all point of time, beta blocker will never come as a loading dose. Yes, sir. Same, Thank you, sir. Same, same with loading dose. Can we add one dose of heparin, sir? No. no, sir. Because you are giving loading dose in case of acute ST elevation MI to prevent a platelet aggregation and plug to early start of plug stabilization. These two only. Mm -hmm. Okay. By giving heparin the proper treatment, so once there is a fibrin mesh, the proper treatment is fibrinolysis. Not because heparin is not going. Once the fibrin mesh is there, heparin will cannot break the fibrin mesh and go on act on the clot. Clotting factor is not antithrombotic will not be there. So you have to do a thrombolysis, then followed with you can give a heparin. So by giving after, heparin after, th after thrombolysis only it is indicated. After thrombolysis. By giving not, heparin, not as a loading dose. Not as loading. By giving heparin, we are in trouble also 
because uh, you are referring patient to me for a angioplasty means i take the angioplasty during angioplasty heparin is there means i cannot titrate the dose of heparin very procedurally so that's also there is a difficulty in uh, with which i have to work on so to overcome it always give only aspirin picagrel 180 mg start in 40 to 80 mg after start in done patients refer either thrombolysis or refer the patient for pci for severe pain morphine also will be ah definitely the other PCA. treatments are there the morphine whatever the sedation you want you can always do. we can give because definitely. of the severity definitely. of the pain yeah definitely definitely but the main treatment is the one you have either thrombolysis or primary pain. These are the only thing which should come in mind. All other treatment is only supportive. Your primary treatment in acute MI is always opening the coronary artery by a thrombolysis or PDC. So when we are sending in the ambulance, uh, keeping a two lines with slow IV fluids, is it a useful, sir, or not? I, in the right inferior wall of my, it's very, very useful. Anterior MI until uh, to reach the higher center, slow IV fluids maintain. In inferior MI, I give uh, sometimes when there is a RVMI, I give two liters of fluid also. So okay. such amount of fluid will be required. So there I am happy. Whereas in anterior MI, patient can land in pulmonary MI because severe LV dysfunction will be there. Only for uh, inferior, we can stop. With, with inferior, definitely we can stop. So, so lead two, three, and the AVM. If yes, it is sir. elevated, we can start surely. Definitely, definitely. Sir. Even the even the pulse rate is normal, we can start. Definitely, we need to start, sir. Inferior alumni, always first 24 hours. I give up to two liters or three liters of fluid, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. No, no roll of steroid if the patient is having severe sweating like this. No roll of steroids. No, stress, absolutely no roll. Stress. Because the stress also will come because of this uh, no role of steroids. No role of steroids, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question? Any people want to get, discuss something? Sir, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Question, sir. Huh? Uh, patient is having excessive sweating in case of uh, MI, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, in that case, anything we have to do, sir? Or, uh... Treat the cause. That's all. Do not bother about the effect. Treat the cause. When you have a MI, loading dose, lysis or PCA, sweating is going to come down market soon. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir, good evening, sir. Ah, Cholunga. Sir, on the uh, stem cell therapy, on the, uh, will it be routine, uh, sir, in future, uh, on the after, uh, on the uh, bypass, kapra, will it be routine, sir? How many days will it take to re uh, regeneration of the cells, sir? In the title, the uh, stem cell care. This is all experiment which uh, is beyond the level of uh, this forum. I'll tell you, it, it is uh, 2008, we had a major trial of uh, stem cell injected, embryonic stem cell injected into the coronary artery. Major yes, trial. It's a landmark trial for stem cell therapy. Yes, so, but uh, none of the stem cell, whatever is injected, matched with your myocardium. That is oh, a difficult. Okay. The skeletal muscle was regenerating, not the myocardial cell. So yes, that sir. was a disconnect between the myocardium and the new regenerated stem cell. Then, so that yes, it was not matching. So we are in the process of identifying how to match the stem cell with your myocardial cell. So yes, once sir. it is matched, it will take another decade or so. Once it oh. is, you can always inject the coronary the coronary artery with the stem cell. Uh, right at the MI period itself, then uh, that the, the study clearly showed during MI it was uh, injected uh, during MI on the second day and uh, it did not still grow, but only thing it did not match with the myocardium and uh, patient was lost. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Sir.
Thank you, sir. Thank right. you. Right. If there is no question, we'll wind up. Happy Diwali. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Happy Diwali, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Happy Diwali, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir.